future. Um, but also about um, well, specifically using examples from some of our work in East Africa. So while a lot of the concepts are just as relevant, whether you're talking about agriculture in East Africa, China or the UK, um, this is the area where I work and it's where I'm most passionate about, I think. So first, I want to just express my appreciation to all of the people that we work with all across the world and particularly PhD students, farmers and field assistants who are the people who are really doing the hard work while I sit around and analyze a bit of data and do some talks. And I think it's really important to say that anything like this is such a team effort. So agriculture is important and I probably don't need to tell you that, but if we look across the world, a lot of um, farmable land in the world is being used for agriculture it's a huge process it's the main crop of a lot of global economies and it's important to every single one of us really it also presents challenges to the environment so it's a huge change to how land is used and that can cause losses right from the ground up whether it's a depauperation of the bacteria that live in the soil, a change in the plant community, and then knock on effects on the insect community and the bird community. It can affect the, the soil and how, and its properties, nutrients can get washed out of farmland and into rivers. It can change the hydrology, especially things like um, if you're growing olives in an intense plantation, like in the top right hand corner of this slide, that's in the south of Spain. It's one of the most water deprived bits of Europe, but it's also got this relatively thirsty tree grown at incredible intensity. And that puts huge stress on the aquifers and causes rivers around there to reduce in their discharge and all sorts of things. So it's a very impactful process. And of course, because it's topical, agriculture is also a major contributor to global carbon emissions, whether you're talking about the livestock elements of it or even to some extent the plant based elements. If you're a farmer, it's not always plain sailing either. So while agriculture does affect the world, it's also affected by the world that it's placed in. And particularly if you're a smallholder farmer, then you're somewhat at the mercy of weather patterns, whether that's um, rain coming late when you expected it earlier or whether it's rain coming earlier when you expected it not for a few weeks and that can really change when you need to put your crop in and when you need to harvest it. Changing temperatures can cause all sorts of challenges to the plants. Um, you can get a mismatch if you rely on pollinators being available in a certain month when your crop flowers but those pollinators emerged a month early you're in trouble. And of course, we're increasingly seeing extreme weather events that really do dramatically affect how our um, agricultural ecosystems can function and occasionally cause a complete crop loss. Things like hurricanes going through the Caribbean and knocking out big chunks of the cocoa agroforestry. Um, so it's, it's not easy being a farmer and having to deal with things like slowly eroding soil fertility and an increasingly challenging array of pests, weeds and diseases that are partly to do with globalization and these things moving around, partly to do with climate changing and making it easier for tropical weeds to survive in subtropical areas and subtropical pests to uh, survive in temperate areas. All of these things make it more and more difficult and the outcomes can be everything from a slight reduction in yield to a complete harvest failure. Fortunately for us, there are some things that we can do. And from my point of view, as an entomologist, as somebody who's concerned with biodiversity, I'm quite glad that most of the time there's a bit of a synergy between what we can do to preserve biodiversity and what we can do to kind of mitigate agriculture's effects on the environment. So quite often the two of them coincide. Occasionally you do get conflicts, but this is often around what trees to plant and where to plant them. Um, and things like biofuels and whether we should be turning over agricultural land to cultivate biofuels and what the effects are for biodiversity. If we think about it within the UK as well, a lot of the habitats that are best for capturing carbon are also ones that we might not be able to properly recreate on farms, but we can capture some essences of that. So an ancient woodland is a fabulous carbon store 
And you can get some aspects of that with a good old hedgerow. Um, a chalk grassland, again, can also be quite good for carbon capture. And things like um, conservation headlands and field margins on agricultural land in the UK can capture a very similar sort of essence, depending on how you're managing them. Um, one thing that we do neglect in the UK is the fabulous carbon capture potential of salt marsh. I can't think of any really particularly good way to recreate that on most farmland, but I think it's something that we do need to be aware of and it's a fascinating environment anyway, so hooray salt marsh. The joint statement on post-2020 global biodiversity framework has suggested that globally every country in the world really needs to be looking at protecting 30% of its land for nature. And the UK has signed up to this and they've agreed that this is the case. Um, and so that would mean possibly, ideally, that we need to be looking at perhaps farming on less land. Unfortunately, I'll try and not get political apart from this, but the UK has decided to count any sort of protected landscape into this protected for nature and biodiversity um, idea. The trouble is that includes things like national parks and areas of outstanding natural beauty. These are areas that can be really quite agriculturally intense and they're being managed as protected landscapes rather than being protected specifically for the biodiversity. So for example, parts of the Lake District are honestly not particularly good for biodiversity whatsoever. They've been uh, deforested and overgrazed to the point of really not having much going on on them at all. So it's, it's a little bit of an awkward greenwash there. If we look at the UK as a whole, um, this map shows all of these areas that technically count as protected at some level. A lot of them are quite in quite poor condition. And the only ones that have really got a biodiversity management plan that's being carried out to a large extent and really supporting those habitats on this map are the ones in the sort of dark blue and purple colours. So that's quite a small percentage overall. Even if we count in parts of lower quality landscapes that are at least considered to be in favourable or improving condition, still probably the best we can say is that about 5 to 10% of the UK is being functionally protected for biodiversity. But a lot of that is in and around agricultural areas to some extent. And that leads us to what should we be doing in order to try and preserve biodiversity, but also meet the food needs of the world. And there's kind of two approaches on this. And it's very difficult to reconcile them both at the same time. So you kind of have to pick one. There's the land sparing approach where you pretty rigorously separate off farmland and nature conservation land. The farmland you focus mostly on economic output. So you're trying to get as much yield out of that, however you can achieve that, which means probably a lot of inputs and probably means that those areas will be not great for biodiversity at all. But the areas that you're not farming are protected pretty much exclusively for nature and managed in a way that's good for biodiversity. And that could be good because it means that you end up with larger contiguous areas that are not having anything nasty done to them, if you like. But it also kind of assumes that you can do agriculture without all of these biodiversity assisted processes. And I don't know how long that would be sustainable for going into the future. Would you eventually exhaust your soils? Would your soil microbiome just lose all of its efficacy? How would you provide pollination services? The other option is land sharing. And this is probably less productive overall because it means that you're de-intensifying the farming a little bit. You're mixing more plants and more insects and all of the other aspects of the ecosystem into your farmland. Unfortunately, it's probably never going to achieve peak anything because you're never going to get as high a yield as from the intensive bits, but you're also never going to get as high biodiversity as you would from a nature reserve. Um, but there are certain animal species, insects, plants and so on that are associated with farmland and do benefit from certain ways that we farm. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky thing to reconcile. And I think different 
groups of people may be better suited to these. If we went for the land sparing approach, that would probably be the end of a small, the smallholder farmers across the world. There's no way that you can really have that sort of livelihood if you've only got one hectare to farm and you've not got a lot of money for inputs. So we'd have to very much rethink the way that whole economies were structured and it would be a big change. So you'd have to have a very large level of commitment. If we're going for something more like a land sharing approach, there's a lot of options that are available. So most of them revolve around the idea that you want more biodiversity and starting from the bottom up, you probably want more plant diversity on your farm. So you could start that by adding in more crops, either over time or in the same space by intercropping. You can add in things like hedgerows, field margins, conservation headlands, buffer strips, beetle banks, which are all basically ways to get kind of semi-natural plant rich habitat on and around your farms. And think just beyond the edges of the farm. Have you got nearby woodland and grassland that you can conserve better so that it's a source of benefits to the farmland and a way that nature can perhaps retreat a little bit from the most intense farmland. You can also look at things like what can you do on your own farm? Can you reduce your pesticide and other agro ag agrochemical inputs? And all of these are big decisions. They're not always easy decisions for a farmer to make because they often come with trade-offs. And the farm is not an island. It's not sitting on its own with no kind of interactions with the surrounding landscape. So the, the wider landscape could have all sorts of habitats and these will confer ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are all of the benefits, if you like, that we get as humans from nature. So this can be everything from uh, soil creation to decomposition to carbon sequestration to flooding control and includes things like pollination and regulation of pests by predators and, and other natural enemies of pests. So sev several of these ecosystem services are coming from insects and that's where I get excited and that's where I come in. These beneficial insects are influenced by the wider landscape, what woodlands are around, what rivers are around, things like that, but they're also influenced by the immediate surroundings on the farm, are there microhabitats? Is there the plant that their larvae need to develop on? Those sorts of things. So we need to think about the semi-natural and natural habitats at different scales on the farm. When we're looking at insects as providers of ecosystem services, the ones that I'll be talking about the most today will be pollinators, because they're my favorites of the lot. Parasitoids, these are mostly wasps that we've been focusing on, but also some flies that lay their eggs inside other insects and that kills them. When the other insect is a major agricultural pest, then you really, really owe a lot to parasitoids. So they're quite important and valuable. And also various predator species. So this can be everything from Dolichopodidae there, which are a little bit like a kind of insect kestrel flying around and sort of hovering and, and patrolling areas and then swooping in to catch prey, um, right through to ladybirds, which are probably more familiar. And these are all really important and the collective benefit that they provide to farms can be in the UK in, in well into the millions of pounds and probably more. And globally, we're talking about a huge, huge benefit that come from all of these. If you're a smallholder farmer, these become even more important because you probably don't always have the money or the ability to get hold of things like pesticides in order to control your pests that way. So being able to rely on these guys that can go out there and, and help control your pests, that's really important. And smallholder farmers are, as ever, the ones who get hit hardest by climate change and pretty much everything else that we do that's horrendous. Um, this is a map of how much the staple crops will get reduced or affected by climate change in the future in different parts of the world. The green areas are parts of the world that are likely to have a moderate or mild increase in crop productivity and yield. 
the orange areas are all the areas of the world where the staple crops will probably decrease in productivity. So you can see that a lot of that effect is across Africa, across South America and across Southeast and Southern Asia, which are often places where smallholder farmers, so people living on low incomes with perhaps one or two hectares of land are gonna be the hardest hit. So if you're a smallholder farmer, what options have you got available? What sort of things do you have to think about? You have to think about how to fertilize your soil and how to ensure that it continues to provide the nutrients your plants need. You may be able to do that with synthetic fertilizer. If not, you might be relying on things like manure if you can get it, or possibly just ash made from the previous year's crops that have been burned. You will probably have pest problems at various points. So what are you going to do about those? You could use pesticides, but if you can get them at all, they may be imported, they may have instructions written in a language you don't speak, they may have been adulterated by a middleman on the way to you, so they could be already mixed with water or bleach or something else. Um, so it's very difficult. But at the same time, whatever pesticides you apply, if they've got negative effects on beneficial insects like pollinators, then that's going to impact on your yield as well. You also need to think about what you're gonna do about water. If you're lucky, you might get two rainfall seasons a year and be able to have two harvests. But if you live in Malawi, there might only be one decent rainfall season a year. And if you want to do a second crop, do you have the resources to put in irrigation in order to provide that off season crop, which might see you through some more difficult times? And then there's things that are completely out of your control. So you might do be doing all of this right and it's going brilliantly. And then suddenly there's a completely unseasonable flash flood or a typhoon comes through, depending on what part of the world you're in and just demolishes your entire crop. And of course, access to all of these depends on how much money you've got available and also how your time works into that. I think a lot of work on international development in the past just assumed that farmers had infinite time, didn't value it and were willing to do as much work as it took in order to maximise their yield. But actually, any farmer anywhere in the world is making rational business decisions about what the benefit is versus what the cost of any intervention. And that includes doing something like pounding a plant for six hours in order to produce some sort of extract that helps their crop. We've been working in East Africa for quite a number of years now, and we've been looking at how smallholders manage their farms which farms seem to have the best productivity and what's happening differently on them. And also sort of fitting that into things like future challenges, new crops, uh, the biodiversity crisis, and potentially climate change and how their climates might alter in the future. Most of the East Africa tends to have some sort of bean smallholder farms, people growing legumes, but common bean, which is kind of kidney beans basically, is a popular crop. It's easy to grow, it does quite well, you can eat the leaves as a vegetable, um, and it's quite tolerant of a range of conditions. Most of these farmers are working on one or two hectares. So for the first part of our project, we've been working in Malawi and Tanzania, and in the last couple of years, we've brought in Kenya and Malawi as well. Uh, we've been brought in Kenya as well, sorry. Bean production across these areas is something that's a useful source of protein. It's not a particularly lucrative sort of um, business to get into. So while some farmers will get perhaps £100 per harvest and they might get two harvests a year, a few of them might be lucky enough to get uh, $400 out of this but some farmers don't actually get any income at all. So the entire bean crop goes to feed their family and they don't get an opportunity to sell it. But what we found is that while the potentially achievable yield is about a ton and a half from each hectare, a lot of farmers only get perhaps a third or a quarter of that. So if we can find ways to close that gap between the typical and achievable yield, then that's hopefully a really good thing. And typical smallholder farms, smallish field like that, and that will be probably farmed by 
one person or their family. And some of them like this are surrounded by a tree rich, plant rich margin, and that can be useful for boundary marking. And that could be a source of pollinators, natural enemies and all sorts of other things. And that's what we've been really interested in. But in other parts of the areas where we work, some of those farms don't have any of that. So this is a Malawian farm and uh, or field. And you can kind of see across the landscape, it goes on for a long way. That's not because one farmer has a massive field. That's dozens and dozens of farmers whose fields run right up to each other. And of course, they all know where the borders of, of their fields are. So that's not contentious, but it's often trees and pathways that mark the edges rather than field margins and hedgerows and things. And farmers cultivate right up to the road in this part. So that means that there isn't really pollinator habitat. There isn't really a place for things like ladybirds or parasitoid wasps to shelter. And that can present certain challenges. So in the first phase of our project, we wanted to understand more about the margins of these fields, the plants that lived in them, and what benefits could come out of them. We were hoping that we'd find plant communities and combinations that would support pollinators, support all of these natural enemies like um, parasitoid wasps, ladybirds, and so on, and also perhaps provide some direct products. So for example, can the leaves be processed into a plant-based pesticide that can be used as an alternative to a synthetic? And botanical pesticides are a really cool and fascinating area. Um, it's quite promising, there's lots of research, there's not that many products that have been brought to market. So most of the commercially available plant-based pesticides are either from the neem tree or from the pyrethrum plant, which is a kind of daisy essentially. Um, but there are lots of other ones that can be made and processed locally. And some of those plants are also medicinal. And of course, if we're managing all of this right, then those field margins can become a carbon store as well. So the first thing we were interested in is, is to what extent do the beans actually benefit from pollination? Um, and Elisante, a PhD student who's now a lecturer at the University of Dodoma, put some bean plants in bags and looked at what was the difference in the seed production, the bean production between the plants in bags that couldn't be accessed by pollinators and the open beans that could. And he found very consistently Plants that had access to pollinators produced more pods per plant, more seeds per pod, and overall a bigger yield. So some people have argued in the past that field beans don't really need pollinators, but I think Elisante demonstrated that in this part of the world, they really do benefit. It's significant enough that a farmer would want to support their insect pollinators. The main pollinator is probably carpenter bees. So while honeybees visit in bigger numbers, carpenter bees are a bit like European bumblebees in terms of being big and fluffy and buzzy and so able to transfer a lot more pollen. The difference is they don't live in colonies, they just live on their own and they kind of live in holes in trees and stuff. They're pretty cool. What we found out during the first stage of this project is that yes, those plant diverse field margins really do make a, a, a difference. So if you've got field margins that have got more species of planting um, and particular species are, are especially beneficial, then you get more pollinators, you get more natural enemies, it's really great. The other thing that we discovered that we hadn't really set out to look at, but did start to realize was important was trees. If you as a smallholder farmer in Tanzania or Malawi have more species of tree on your farm, this seems to provide loads of benefits in terms of benefiting the carpenter bee population and other things. And of course, those are also a carbon store and they're providing a structure for the overall habitat so you can get birds moving in and things like that. It's quite exciting. So I think trees on African farmland are something we really need to be paying more attention to. Another thing that we noticed in Malawi in particular was that some of the most interesting field margins were where a field jutted up against a graveyard. And a lot of the villages have these areas that are essentially woodland areas that are protected and uncultivated because they're used for burying the people who live within the village. 
And this really struck me as something that we need to pay more attention to, the role of people's culture and their beliefs in preservation of biodiversity and, and the natural environment. And this is a pattern that we see all across the world, really. So whether it's Malawian graveyards or this is a map of a, a section of agricultural Ethiopia. And those two areas that I ringed in red there, those are church forests. So in the center of that, of each of those areas is an Ethiopian Orthodox church. And around that is a forest that's sacred land, so it's protected. And even in the same way in the UK, in a town, the graveyard of a church may be one of the world best protected green spaces, whether or not it's managed particularly for biodiversity, it's a green space that probably sees a higher level of respect and maintenance and protection compared to some of the areas around. So I think we do need to remember that culture plays a really important role in how green spaces can be important to people and the biodiversity potential of them. Anyway, we looked at all different field margin plants. We looked at whether their presence was predictive of different plants, of different insects being present. Um, we looked at um, whether pollinators were visiting them and then going on to visit beans. And we found that there were several species that seemed to be associated with good things happening. So this is Acanthosperm hispidum. Um, farms that had this plant present also seem to have more carpenter bees. I don't know if that's because it directly benefits the carpenter bees. I'm actually skeptical. I don't think it does, but it could be that the habitats where this grows well are also habitats that are suitable for carpenter bees. But this is also a great plant for farmers to have on their farm, potentially, because it's got anti-worming properties, which you could use on livestock or potentially on people in traditional medicine. However, it's an introduced exotic plant from South and Central America. Similarly, Agaratum conizoides, it's a really pretty plant, it's really widespread, it, it grows like a weed, because essentially it is, but it's visited by so many bee species, it seems to be quite an attractive pollinator plant, and they can go on to visit the bean plants as well. It's, the leaves can be processed into one of those amazing botanical pesticides, and it's also got medicinal properties. But again, it's an invasive exotic plant that's been introduced from tropical Americas. And then when we looked at trees, again, Grevillea robusta was associated in a lot of farms with the presence of more pollinators and things like that. It's a useful timber tree, it's really tolerant of drought, so it's, it's really well suited to the environment. And it's probably capturing carbon in the process of growing because it's a tree. But it's another introduced tree from Australia. So we're getting all of these plants and they seem to be conferring most multiple benefits. But I think the lesson that we were learning was that this needs to proceed with caution because so many of these plants that were beneficial are introduced from other tropical regions of the world. And, <coughs> and this could be a kind of legacy of the colonial past and the way that these places were managed. Um, it could be that globalization has caused them to move around. And as a result, we may have lost a lot of the traditional and um, native plants from these regions. And so we've got this kind of depauperate uh, flora to work with in the first place if we're trying to design field margins. But I think it means that we need a much better understanding of what's going on before we start recommending that people plant lots of these plants. But at the same time, these may be the best suited plants to the future because they may be well suited to climate change and things like that. So it's, it's really difficult and complex and I don't have the answer to what should we be putting in field margins just yet. The second phase of the project, we were focusing more on the pest management problems um, and how, how best to kind of control aphids in particular because these are really bothering some of the farmers. And we were hoping to see how we can combine different things in order to get a kind of net gain. So how can we choose landscapes that confer those ecosystem services? Can we combine them with less harmful alternatives to pesticides like some of those botanicals? 
can we mix intercropping into all of this perhaps to help control pests? Is, is a mixed bean and maize field better at controlling pests than a bean field alone? Um, and how do the margins fit into all of that? Are they something that really is providing a big benefit? So our theory was that if you get a landscape with more habitat, uh, plant rich habitat that's added on the farm as well, so field margins and things and reduce some of those more damaging inputs, this will lead to more of your beneficial insects because they're not being wiped out, they've got all the resources they need. And that in turn would control all your pests and that would lead to higher yields for the farmer. So that's kind of what we were hoping for. And at the same time, we we're expecting that this would provide rapid recovery from stresses. So if you do have to, for example, spray with a synthetic, would the, all the beneficial insects bounce back quicker if you've got things like field margins compared to um, if you don't? And would this also perhaps confer some climate resilience? We didn't set out to test this, but it's likely that where you're getting these more resilient ecosystems overall, that would in turn mean that when, when climate starts to change and you get changes in weather patterns and things, which they're already reporting from many of the farms that we work with, then hopefully these sorts of landscapes would help that. First thing was we wanted to understand how aphids and beans interact. And yeah, indeed we found that the more aphids you have on your farm, the lower your yield of beans tends to be. So aphids really are a problem. It's not just farmers are complaining about them for no reason. They genuinely are causing significant yield loss because they're sucking the sap of the beans and weakening the plant and possibly also spreading diseases. We also found that when you had more parasitoid wasps on your farm, your yield went back up again. So aphids bad, parasitoid wasps really good. When we started to look at natural habitats around the farm, we got some slightly mixed but broadly positive results. So depending on where you are in this East African region, having woodlands and grasslands and rivers and things around your farm seems to boost the number of insect predators to some extent, regardless of what's happening within your farm. But this mostly seemed to be happening in Tanzania and less so in the other two countries. So it's complex, it's not reliable. And this is a finding that is repeated all across the world, whether you're looking at it in, in Brazil or whether you're looking at it in China or whether you're looking at it in agricultural regions of Germany, that in general, having these natural habitats around your farm confers benefits, but not consistently, not all the time and not for everyone. So what else was available? We, we looked at combining interventions and um, credit to Lawrence Ochiang, who's an MSc student. He's done some really interesting work on this. So this is a bit of a stinky graph, so we'll go through it slowly. If you're a farmer and you don't do anything on your farm at all, so no, no kind of pest management options whatsoever, then you get some yield, but it's a bit rubbish because you have huge pest problems. If you spray your crop with synthetic pesticides, you kind of double your yield effectively. So that's, that's great. You get a lot more food, you get a lot more money. If you apply botanical insecticides, so these are things derived from neem, pyrethrum, so plants that are available. Um, Lawrence used a commercial product available in Kenya, but equally, this could be something that's prepared on the farm by harvesting some of those field margin plants then you get similar sorts of yields to when you use the synthetics, but it's much less environmentally damaging. So you get much more of these natural um, enemies of pests, these beneficial insects. And it also puts the farmer at less risk. It means the food's less contaminated. So this is quite exciting, the fact that we found that its performance was broadly comparable. And what if you start combining those botanical insecticides with, um, managing your field margins better. So you're providing refuge for those beneficial insects to go into. Well, the farms that had no field margin, so those are the ones where I've just stuck up the pink icons, consistently performed less well than the farms that had a plant rich field margin. So it seems like your best performance overall is that, um, uh, uh, that column labeled 
be. So that's where you're using a botanical insecticide and rich field margins. So this is cool. This is wins for biodiversity. This is wins probably for carbon capture. It's wins for general environmental resilience. And it's also giving the farmers a great yield. And the yields are kind of com comparable to conventional smallholder agriculture, but perhaps more safely. So we're really excited about this. Um, it does seem like when you're providing all of these elements in a landscape, then this can lead to more natural enemies, fewer aphids and higher yields, but it's not always consistent. So we need to do more work. We need to understand what particular elements of the wider landscape are most beneficial. Is it rivers? Is it woodlands? Um, and how best to mix all of these things together to get the optimum outcome for our smallholder farmers. And again, while we were looking at this with smallholder farmers in East Africa, a lot of these exact same principles can be applied to UK agriculture. So the same concepts of if we set aside field margins on, on farms, will they provide habitat for pollinators and natural enemies? And most of the time, yeah, they do. And that feeds in turn into benefits to the crop yield that way. Is it feasible to switch out synthetic pesticides for botanicals in the UK? At the moment, it's difficult because it's very hard to get botanical based products registered. So there's kind of all sorts of policy and regulatory barriers and they aren't always quite as effective. But maybe it's something we should be exploring in the future. And certainly we should be looking at how our farmland fits into the wider landscape and seeing how they interact and what are the benefits that come from that and treasure those relatively less disturbed habitats out there. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, climate's going to change and especially in a lot of these smallholder systems, some of the crops that have kind of boomed over the last few years may be more and more difficult to grow. So examples might include avocados. These are really difficult in areas that are water stressed because they're very thirsty plants. And that's already causing problems, for example, in Chile, where the intensive avocado farms are kind of draining the water table. So the small holder farmers in the valleys are finding they're not yielding properly from their own crops anymore. So we may have avocado issues in the future. Similarly, crops that are associated with mountains and upland areas can become a real struggle in the future. So this is coffee and it tends to grow in highland areas. As climate changes and particularly warms, then the lowland areas get increasingly too hot for coffee. So it kind of has to be moved up the hill. Trouble with hills is as you go up them, they get smaller towards the top. So for highland crops like that, we're likely to gradually lose land area where these can be produced. However, for a smallholder farmer who's mostly working for subsistence, there's lots of traditional crops that may provide alternatives um, and lots of, lots of crops that may be more climate resilient, more drought resilient, as long as we can deal with pests and diseases. So these can be things like sorghum, which has got a very long history in Africa, or cassava, which is really drought resistant, it grows well in quite poor soils, um, and you can leave the tubers in the ground for several months in order to spread your harvest a little bit. But the downside with some of these is that novel pests and diseases are coming in and causing all manner of problems. So it's gonna be continue to be complex. I think where we might end up in the future is that farming will more and more diverge. So, we'll get some parts of the world where we'll be going for precision farming and very high tech solutions. So this is a kind of indoor growing environment. And so you could potentially power something like that off solar power because it's a very clean environment. You can minimize your pest problems and optimize your plant growth, but it requires a lot of resources to set up. On the other hand, we could, where the agriculture is still outdoors, then maybe we'll end up heading more towards a kind of land sharing approach with de-intensified approaches and looking more at the biodiversity on our farms. Only one of those is available if you're a smallholder farmer. And I guess in the future, smallholder farmers will essentially become extinct. Um, it'll become less and less feasible to stay in the industry um, from a point of view of the economics and 
the inputs required and the risks. So probably farms will become bigger, bits of land will become aggregated. But I think there's lessons that can be learned that can be taken into the future about perhaps keeping some of our farmland a bit more friendly to biodiversity. And hopefully that will be to all of our benefit into the future. So I will leave that there. I think that's OK for timekeeping. Perfect, Sarah, thank you. Yeah, that was 